Hello, and welcome back to another episode. It's been a very busy weekend in our household. Uh, this weekend, with the help of my amazing wife, I, we, constructed this, a bespoke media unit here in the living room. And I could not be more happy or pleased or excited with how it's turned out. It's very funky. Um, in some way, in one form or another, this thing has been living in our heads and being planned for the past couple of years. Uh, really, ever since we moved in, we knew that we needed to do something in this corner, uh, but it's always been something that, something that we could put off uh, until fairly recently. Uh, actually, when we moved in, it was clear that this corner, even though this, we've got a, quite a large living room here, this corner was gonna be the place where the TV would have to go. This is where the, the TV aerial comes in to connect to the digi box or whatever. And so this, was, this is where the TV would have to live. But the TV unit we had from our old house wouldn't wouldn't fit in this space. It was a big IKEA thing that, that that worked in that smaller living room, oddly, against a wall. It had a huge wall space to itself. Whereas here, it's an alcove next to a chimney, and there's 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 a limited amount of space. And so we we thought, well, we have to get some new bit of TV furniture. And it was about four days before we moved into this house that one of our neighbours, we were walking the dog, and one of our neighbours had, had put out uh, a TV unit. It was, it was just before it was starting to rain, and this unit was just sat on their, on their lawn. And there's this sort of unspoken rule around here. It may well be the same across the world, who knows, but certainly in the northeast of England we've learned that people just put stuff outside and they, they fully expect that a neighbor or the rag and bone man or something or, you know, whatever, a, a, a dealer is going to come along and just, just take that thing away and do with it what they want. They'll sell it, they'll burn it, they'll use it, you know. And so in our case, we, we were like, perfect, you know, coincidence, serendipity, absolutely spot on. And before, just before it started to rain, we more or less ran back to the house, got the car, picked up this unit and it was perfect. It was sat here. Well, I say perfect, it was functional. It sat in this space quite well. But it was never quite right, in so much as I've got a lot of games consoles, and also we've got a lot of DVDs. And not all of those DVDs are stored in the two treasure chests uh, that, that we keep most of our films in, in little pockets. We have certain films like the Marvel movies, or the Lord of the Rings trilogy, or the Indiana Jones box set, or the Dark Knight movies, that we want to keep out in their, in their bespoke boxes. And they had to sit on a bookshelf behind that TV unit in the corner. And that was always a bit awkward. It was behind the TV, it was sort of down, you know, and dusty, and it was just, it was just, it was impractical. But it was functional, it just about worked, and therefore we sort of hobbled along with it for a while. And bit by bit I added to that space, I built a little, a little, out of, you know, odd, odd bits of wood, a little sort of two-tiered cabinet thing to store our treasure chests in, to keep the films, and it, it, we, we were limping along, but it was never, it was never really, it was never really working properly. Uh, and so, bit by bit we started to think, well what do we want from this space? What do we need from this space? And what we needed really was to have it less cluttered, to have ideally things clearly accessible, and I suppose as an afterthought, or as part of it, an element of display as well, especially when it comes to you know, GameCube, Dreamcast, and it just, as, I, you know, we wanted, I wanted it also actually, to, to, to be able to look at these things and, and admire their aesthetic presence as much as anything else, as opposed to just having them shoved in a small cupboard with a glass door. So we started uh, back in, I think, April. Well, we started formally planning back in around about April. Uh, and uh, I started by taking a photograph of this alcove. And here's the photo that I took on. I also printed out some uh, scaled, like scaled grid, basically, where I think each square is a centimeter. That's my understanding, at least. And uh, on this grid, uh, or on this, this photo, you can see there was a floating shelf in this alcove. There the, that's the, uh, the bookcase with all our um, box sets on it, and the TV unit was sitting in front of it, just here. And this is how we started, and we knew that we had roughly 140 centimetres width to play with. I say roughly 140 centimetres, because this is a 1930s house, and so, uh, especially in North Tyneside, nothing's quite straight. This wall actually bows with a variance of about four centimeters from top to bottom. It starts down at the bottom at 140, it ends at the top at 141, and in the middle, it reaches 143. Uh, so, 
it's uh, it's not quite straight, not quite square, and we have to sort of work with work with that in mind as well. But that's how we started. We we took a photo of the alcove and started just to sort of just to do a bit of blue sky um, thinking. So we knew the space that we had to play with, but next we had to decide on the the, the material, uh, the, the 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 stuff that we're actually going to use to build the shelves themselves, because the, well the wood takes up space and if you want to know how much space you have to to put dvds and games consoles in you need to know how much i suppose negative space i guess is being taken up by the the, the material itself and we, we gravitated towards the idea of using reclaimed wood we have in the past uh used for example reclaimed pallets to build a bookcase i actually built a a um a bookcase for my wife's cookbooks in the kitchen out of pallet wood and that that, that looks quite nice it's got character uh, it's not not boring you know it's, a, it's it's just interesting to look at and it looks frankly it looks made it looks as though we've made it we wanted to be obvious that this isn't you know something that you just bought from from ikea for example uh, so yeah we went to to the wood reclamation yard just up the road where we got that pallet wood from and uh, we gravitated towards scaffolding boards. That's, actually, that's what these are. They're scaffolding planks. And they're designed to take a human's weight. You know, they, they, they don't really bend much. They're, they're, they're worked enough that they're, that they're quite neat and tidy, but they're not, they're not overworked, they're not sanded smooth. They've got a bit of character to them. And we liked that a lot. Unfortunately, though, scaffolding boards are very, very popular uh, <laughs> for, for DIY projects, but also actually for other people who are who are doing uh, things like like furniture as well. Um, people use them for for, for you know, standing on for painting ceilings and also making stuff out of. So all that they really had in the wood woodyard were the ends, the bits with the metal framing where they'd been chopped off each end, stacked up loads of these things and a couple of, of scaffolding boards because there's always a huge rush. Whenever the, when there's a job lot from build, a building site that comes in, people run in and they just go straight away. <clears throat> also, the cost we were looking at was around about 20 pounds a board. And we, we estimated that we needed nine, maybe nine or 10 of these things. That'd be like 200 pounds for, for, for this unit, which we, we weren't really willing to spend. So we, 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 yeah, we shelved the notion for a bit. We kept on thinking about it. And I kept on just Googling, really. Um, Scaffolding boards, deals, this kind of thing. And then one morning in May, uh, I woke up and for some reason, the first thing I did like at seven o'clock in the morning was, oh, take my phone, Google. And I Googled scaffolding as I did every day. And suddenly on the local sort of DIY supermarket being Q's website, there was a deal. And this deal was amazing. It was three scaffolding boards, yeah, packs of three for 11, 90 something 11.95 shall we say so 12 pounds each now bearing in mind that in B&Q one scaffolding board costs around about 15 pounds packs of three for 12 was incredible it's like four or five pounds a pack that's astonishing so well yeah four between four and five you know uh, it's not a bit, yeah, huge saving. So I, I went straight into the store and said, look, this is, you've got this deal on your website. Can you replicate this in store? And they said, um, no, no, we cannot. No, uh, you can buy packs of three. Uh, you can, so you can buy three individual uh, planks here, but that will cost you £45 for three instead of 12. Uh, or we can order it via the website and it'll, this, this, or the order will be fulfilled in a matter of days. I was like, yeah, go on then. Yeah, sure. I'm, yeah. So I put in an order for uh, four packs of, of three um, scaffolding boards. So 12 in total, just to cover our bases. And that was about 50 quid with delivery, you know. Perfect. Wonderful. We were making like a 75% saving on the, the reclaimed stuff. So, you know, we, we were slightly sacrificing on, on the character, but we were definitely making a saving. Unfortunately, though, the the two days passed, uh, at which point I was meant to get a text message saying, hello, we're going to be de delivering your scaffolding today. And I didn't get a text message. So I called B&Q uh, at the help desk and they said, um, hello, sir. Yes, unfortunately, the um, the order was, uh, uh, the pricing, sorry, was uh, was, was a mistake. It was, wasn't meant to be £12 for three scaffolding boards. It was actually meant to be 
something more akin to 45 50 per, per pack uh, now uh, the thing is uh, we have to honor the purchase that you've made but it may take some extra time because the the people who supply us with the scaffolding boards have been overrun with orders because builders from across the country <laughs> and also people from across the country just go oh, look at that deal and just dived on it and so it took uh, it took about four months four months for us to actually get hold of our scaffolding boards that we ordered back in May. So they arrived right at the end of August, uh, just before we were going away for a bit to North Wales. So they, they've been sat behind our couch for, for about a month and a half. <laughs> and they've been a very useful shelf in that time, a very useful place just to put the laptop or put a D&D &D sheet or something when you're working on it. But nonetheless, we had our, our material, we knew the space, and we could proceed to the next step, and that was finalizing the design. So, a couple of weeks ago, we finalized the design in uh, one of my notebooks, Field Notes, Ideas and Designs, Volume 1 of 8. I've got eight of these books ready to be filled up. Uh, and here we are. This is a diagram that we drew uh, to, to, to scale. One millimeter equals one centimeter. And I even printed off the electronics to scale as well, so we knew how they were going to fit in the alcove. And we were happy with that. All we needed was a dry weekend to make it happen. Two weekends ago, it was dry, but we were busy. We, we agreed to do activities with friends. Uh, this weekend, it was pouring down and windy on Saturday, and we nearly cancelled the idea. We were like, oh, we can't do it today. But no. No, we knuckled down and we did it. Uh, we'd bought a circular saw just for this job. Uh, a, a, a very reasonable bargain, actually, from Aldi. Only 36 pounds. Uh, work zone, really high quality, but really, um, really um, affordable, shall we say. Not cheap, affordable. We had a circular saw, we set up a gazebo outside, and I just went to work. We started chopping wood and fitting it to the wall. Now, um, the hardest shelf to put in actually was the first shelf. It took about two hours. <laughs> but it took two hours because uh, we really needed to get it absolutely right. We wanted it to fit really snugly in the wall. We wanted it to be straight across from the chimney to the other wall. Uh, and we, this was basically the, the datum point. This was the, the, the shelf from which all the other shelves would get their, would get their level and also to get their... their, their um, face if so I mean, we needed all the front facing parts of the shelves to be in line down the wall so it took it took a couple of hours to get the first one in place but by the end of, of Saturday we'd worked down to uh, this shelf just here and uh, and on Saturday night we were just in time to watch Strictly Come Dancing uh, 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 you know, a dancing game show and uh, and it was it was exhausting but it was it was so satisfying uh, to do now, as we proceeded, the uh, the real challenge in a house like this is the old and slightly crappy bricks. As I say, the northeast of England isn't the most valued area of Britain, and so the 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 bricks that that that, that we got for some reason in the 1930s were just just terrible bricks. They're they're slightly clumsy clumsily made. They're often They've got marks and fingerprints all over them, but also they're often overbaked as well. So inside these bricks, they're often well. If you're lucky, they're just black. They're just burned. If you're unfortunate, you've, and you pick up the wrong spot on the wall, they've actually been baked to to be almost like a ceramic. Uh, and, and so they're so hard that it's almost impossible to actually drill. It's, it's harder than steel actually. So you have to really get a very good masonry drill bit to to to, to drill into these walls. Um, in order to hang the shelves, we, we didn't want to have brackets underneath them, like L shapes on the wall that you could see coming up the wall and underneath. We wanted to sort of slightly hide the brackets. And so I went slightly unconventional and I've used corner braces to, 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 to put uh, onto the wall, but then to ha put the shelf onto those braces so that the shelf itself actually hides the attachment to the wall somewhat. Uh, and and that that works. It sort of creates a semi-floating appearance, I guess, to the shelves, and I'm quite pleased with that. And I say unconventional because you wouldn't think it would be enough to hold the weight of the shelf. But the thing is, the scaffolding board is quite light, 
What we're putting on these shelves isn't overly heavy. After all, the TV, for example, is hanging from the wall, and we'll come to that in just a moment. Um, and uh, and the, uh, the the shelves are pushing, uh, are fairly tightly fit to the screws that are pushing back into the wall. So everything is sort of pressure fit and works. It's unconventional, but it does sit in place quite nicely. Uh, and then on Sunday, we finished the other uh, three shelves below for the DVDs. I am very pleased with how it's worked out. And uh, I'm sure you guys want to have a bit of a closer look. So let's do that. So uh, starting at the bottom, I guess, we have our DVDs. Those are the two treasure chests I was mentioning. Uh, now, uh, proudly facing clasps out, as it were, um, with labels, A to K, L to Z. And just here actually is the box where we keep the DVD covers from those DVDs that we have unboxed. Uh, maybe a slightly bigger box for those DVD covers actually. But th these shelves contain the DVDs that, that, well, either, in the case of, for example, Halo Legends, are waiting to be and you know lock out and Blair Witch are waiting to be put into the treasure chests, <laughs> or boxes that that we didn't want to just throw away. So things like, for example, you know the Casino Royale Special Edition, Back to the Future trilogy, Alien box sets, Evil Dead, Mighty Boosh, Rome, Tintin, Lord of the Rings and Hobbit, um, West Wing, Harry Potter, Indiana Jones, Star Wars. Dark Knight trilogy, Marvel movies. That's that's what's at the bottom uh, down here, and it just makes it makes it so much better being accessible, not being hidden on that bookshelf behind the TV unit as it was previously. As we move up, we come to something actually which I forgot to mention before, and that is that when we were planning and sourcing the idea of of scaffolding boards, we also planned for this TV being used as it often is, for example, at Christmas. Because if it's going to be in the alcove, hidden, as it were, behind the chimney breast here, then it also needed to, needed to be able to come out from the alcove so that people, for example, when they visited at Christmas, there's a chair over there that needs fixing, ignore that chair. Um, when they were sitting there, needed to be able to see the TV here. And to that end, we found an extraordinarily long TV uh, wall mount. It comes out to a full length of about a metre, and we only really needed about 40, 50 centimetres. But that was longer than your typical bracket TV wall mount. So we found this thing, uh, bought it back in May, again, ready to ready for a May bank holiday weekend when we could hopefully use the scaffolding and, the, and this TV bracket, but the, the scaffolding never arrived, the scaffolding boards never came. So yeah, this thing has been sitting around waiting to be used until this weekend. And, uh, and we also did lots of cable tying on Sunday. My wife loved doing the cable tying, absolutely adored it. Uh, she loves tidying up um, cables. <laughs> um, and also, uh, we have all the power sorted as well now. Everything is individually switched and it's all surge protected. Very happy about that. And also very happy about the uh, HDMI uh, multi-socket in and out there it means I don't have to swap HDMI cables when I swap consoles. It's very swish, very pleasing. The TV is the same as ever. It's uh, it's not the biggest TV in the world, but it's perfect for our needs. Uh, it sits quite nicely in that space. And the beauty of this design actually is that it's sort of future-proof. The, the wall bracket is designed for a much bigger, much heavier TV than this one. So uh, actually much a bigger TV than actually this alcove can handle so so at some point we could get a bigger tv have it sit forward of the unit and just move it side to side in terms of access to wires and consoles but for now this is this is fine and we, and we love it uh, something else that we love and i love in particular is the alcoves though for the the games consoles we have the gamecube here with the game boy player attachment and yes okay there's not not much room in terms of being able to get at discs but you can pull it out put a disc in push it back in you know it, it works it's fine we have a xbox 360 controller and behind it instead of a second one charging we have a gamecube controller sat there you know because the gamecube just below we have our dreamcast and a dreamcast controller sitting ready to play uh xbox 360 our digibox for uh, digital TV, our PlayStation 4, and then down here, PlayStation 2. 
And then we have our PlayStation 2, PlayStation 4 uh, controllers, uh, along with a Switch uh, Joy-Con adapter. And then here we have the Switch plugged in, ready to go. This setup with the, the consoles on display, accessible, is just a dream come true for me. And I, it's not ostentatious, it's not one of those ridiculous, you know, bespoke, purely gaming setups that you sometimes see. But this in terms of accessibility, in terms of affordability, and also in terms of an element of display. You know, taking a bit of pride in the fact that, that I do love these consoles and, the, and these, these games is is just wonderful and, and i'm in that sense i'm so lucky to have a wife that lets me do that you know there are so many frankly you know uh, some people in my family who uh who uh, aren't allowed to do this sort of stuff so my wife is amazeballs <laughs> um above we have uh, a dreamcast shelf this is something again wonderful about having a bespoke unit is we were able to design a shelf that would take uh stacks of dreamcast games for a time and it works out almost perfectly. There's enough room for one more stack over there, as and when I get any more Dreamcast games. I don't plan on getting many more, but you know, it uh, again, it works quite well. Above, we have PlayStation 2 games and uh, GameCube games, and also a couple of original PlayStation games and original Xbox games. Uh, my Xbox 360 games, PlayStation 4 games, and Switch games are stored in the other unit, the unit that, 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 that I've shown in a previous video. These ones here were in the small TV cabinet and were just inaccessible. I couldn't really see what was there, especially with the, uh, the um, Dreamcast games. They were stacked up in piles of like 10 or 12 at a time, one, bit, one stack behind another. It was hard to find what I wanted when I wanted it, whereas now... It's just there, just above the TV. And then above that, we have <laughs> a Panda Bus box. And actually, I'm, I'm just gonna ah, see if I can grab it, grab it off the shelf because this thing ah, is fantastic. Ah, don't, don't fall. There we go. <laughs> um, because it's it's not only a Panda Bus, which is awesome in its own right, but it's great storage. Uh, in this case, got some various cables and accessories for the consoles in the uh, engine compartment. We have some memory cards and VMUs, which is quite funky. And then the other boxes up there, which I won't bash the camera with, um, I have, you know, extra controllers. There's the Dreamcast uh, light gun, uh, Dreamcast fishing rod in there. Uh, there's a there's some um, some um, seen it controllers as well for the Xbox 360, and also as well a wireless keyboard because sometimes I attach my laptop to the TV and it's useful for for that sort of stuff. So this whole unit, do we dare do we dare put this thing back up? Let's see, will it work? Ooh. Ooh. We did not plan to have a panda bus, but I'm so glad that we do. We found that literally on Sunday morning. <laughs> but I think it finishes off the unit beautifully along with those uh, those other accessory boxes. I am super pleased with this unit and I'm so happy that the plan worked, you know? In the past I've done DIY projects where maybe the measurements weren't quite right or maybe I was a bit impatient when it came to, to getting hold of the right materials or making the decisions about how to build something and uh, I was a bit nervous if I'm honest about constructing this because it, it you know it's, it sat in front of us all the time in the living room uh, but it's it's centimeter perfect millimeter perfect in fact and the whole thing is wonderful I'm a, I'm I'm so pleased so happy and so fortunate as I say my wife was a huge help but also the fact that the fact that she that she loves media as well film and also computer games enough for, to, 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 to put this in in our house is just wonderful I'm a lucky boy I'm a lucky boy and I know it <laughs> so there you have it a bespoke media alcove unit uh, perfect for our needs 
and something of a dream come true for me, I have to say. I'm just so pleased with it. As ever, guys, until next time, do take care. Bye-bye.